Now, I'm up here because my colleague, who I hope will join us on the screen, Paul Bradley. So, if Paul is there. Hello, Gordon. Hi, hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, well, well thank you, Gordon, uh, for that uh, introduction, and uh, uh, hi to everyone. I'm, uh, as Gordon said, I'm really sorry that I can't be here today, but um, I'm having to self-isolate. But nevertheless, from uh, from my home remotely, I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about uh, what INSTEM are doing in the area of target uh, safety assessment. So I'll start with a, a well-worn slide. I'm sure you've seen many versions of this. And it shows that, as we know, drug development is a risky and, and expensive and time-consuming uh, process. And one of the issues that we're dealing with is that the risk can be seeded very early on in the process, often when not enough is known about the target biology. And this can result in, uh, in on-target effects on target toxicologies. And unfortunately, that risk might not reveal itself until much later on, where a great deal of investment has uh, already been made. And this is what we're trying to deal with, this, this so-called translational uh, gap, where great ideas fail to make it to the clinic or issues become apparent later on, which might have been anticipated had you know, perhaps more attention been paid to the target biology at, at an earlier stage. And at INSTEM, the team are aiming to respond to the industry's desire to reduce and identify this risk at a much uh, earlier stage. So our particular take on, on this is the, the Target Safety Assessment, or TSA for short. And the goals of TSA are stated really well in this article by Richard Brennan of Sanofi. So he, he describes them as firstly to identify the risks associated with modulating a target to propose risk mitigation strategies to shepherd the compounds through the R&D pipeline, to confirm unavoidable on-target toxicities to inform early program advancement decisions, and to anticipate and manage clinical adverse events. So what we're doing is we've responded to this and created a target safety assessment service, and we call this uh, Knowledge Scan. And uh, in this, we produce a dossier of information uh, around the target that reveals many aspects of target biology that might be considered a downstream risk. And uh, we call this a technology-enabled uh, workflow. And by this, we mean we combine the best of uh, automation and machines together with careful and uh, judicious use of human expertise. So list a few of the benefits, if you like, here. We want to produce a comprehensive assessment. It's difficult for humans often to read a few dozen um, articles, papers, uh, without flagging, but a machine can obviously process many, many more, many thousands. We want to reduce biases, confirmational bias, sampling bias that might occur. And we want to provide benefits around data quality, uh, cost, turnaround time, that sort of thing. So briefly, just to touch on data sources, you know, where do we gather the as much information and intelligence as possible to help us answer these questions and build that dossier that we've talked about, uh, about potential risk? Well, in, in recent years, more and more data have become available in the public domain for researchers uh, worldwide to exploit, and uh, some of the uh, types of data are referenced here. But often, uh, the, the information that we find isn't very well structured. It can be written in different styles, adopt different standards. And I know that several people have, uh, have alluded to the, the sort of standards that are emerging in the, in the industry. And generally, the most challenging area for us, not surprising, is, as we show on this slide, unstructured text. And uh, generally, what we're talking about here is the, is the literature and PubMed being a popular source of that. And this is where we can start to use our workflow to identify those literature areas uh, that speak to various elements of, of target safety. And to help us with this, uh, we've developed uh, uh, tools such as vocabularies that speak to uh, important features and uh, relationships within text. And the table here shows how we've applied a modified version of the, the MEDRA vocabulary, which I'm sure uh, everyone is familiar with. And this has been optimized and expanded by us to tailor it to this particular application. So these vocabularies can help us to, to stratify uh, literature, as you see here in the table, into different disease areas. So we see here areas of uh, vascular disorders, uh, cardiac disorders, and neoplasms. And uh, helps us to identify, again, important areas that may feed into our target safety assessments. But using vocabularies 
in this way it doesn't always take us quite far enough and this is where we start to use more uh, advanced techniques if you like such as uh, text mining to identify disease areas that are potentially linked to a modulation of a target function and we've also uh, developed a supervised machine learning approaches to filter out key findings from certain sections uh, of abstracts and, uh, and reports and using a combination of these approaches, we can generate a really high quality uh, corpus of literature that becomes a critical source for us to start tagging, uh, uh, data mining, and also curating. Uh, there's a visual representation of a corpus on the, on the right-hand side of the image here. And we call this a, a fountain plot. And it gives you a thematic uh, landscape of, uh, of, of the literature around a particular target. So here, for example, um, you can see, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but the respiratory and thoracic and vascular um, areas at the top of the graph are particularly well populated, but not so much the ear and labyrinth at the, the, the middle uh, sort of left-hand side. And really the value in all of this and the aim of all of this is to, is to substantially reduce the amount of information that, that a human would need to review because the information goes through this human validation stage before it enters the, uh, the report. So this is unstructured text, as I say, one of the most challenging and, and costly uh, areas for us to, to research. But next, I just want to move on to uh, where we would look at the, the pharmacology around a target. So here, we're really interested in finding compounds that have uh, potency and uh, selectivity for a target. So we can start to infer something about target modulation from, from the action of these uh, compounds in uh, biological systems. And a, an excellent source we found uh, of this type of data is Kemble, again, another well-known uh, resource. And they've done a great job of curating the pharmacology information from researchers around the globe and making it freely available for uh, analysis. <laughs> And to help us get a, a rapid view over what can be thousands or even tens of thousands of data points, we've developed uh, this plot that we, that we showed on the slide here that we call it the BB plot. And in the interest of time, I won't go too much into the detail, but of course, uh, and it's, it's uh, no problem to follow up with, with any specific questions. But each spot or each circle on the graph represents a, a Kemble uh, compound, which demonstrates activity for uh, a target of interest. And here, as you see, we're, we're, we're talking about the prostacyclin um, receptor. On the horizontal axis, we have the potency uh, represented here by the, 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 the P Kemble value, and information is available uh, online on the derivation of that value, with selectivity on the y-axis. Axis. So compounds that lie above the, the zero line here uh, demonstrate selectivity for the prostacyclin receptor over other uh, target types, whereas spots, uh, compounds below the line uh, demonstrate higher potency for some other target. And this type of plot is really useful uh, to us because if a compound has high selectivity and high potency, such as those in the, in the right-hand corner, top right-hand corner, rather, of the, of the plot here, then they provide really valuable tools for us to start inferring something about uh, target safety in particular, if, 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 of course, they've been tested in the uh, appropriate systems. So here we have a, a different visualization, this time a, a heat map, and it's of mRNA and protein expression. It's a different data type again, but equally important to us because even though in many cases there may be uh, limited or no information about the role of a gene in a particular organ, the presence of mRNA or protein uh, may suggest a potential role. So it's important that we perform and we call this an anatomical uh, review. For example, if the gene's expressed at some level in the retina, uh, we might be able to infer some role in retinal function. And this gives us a starting point to start to identify its specific role and potential consequences, importantly, of its uh, modulation in, in various systems. So the real value of this heat map, which isn't revealed entirely by this slide, is that we can provide it as a dynamic and uh, interactive view so the user can zoom in uh, or out or drill down into specific areas and cell types. And this has been really popular with, uh, with, with many of our clients. So I just wanted to revisit the, um, the concept of literature analysis just for uh, this, this final uh, content slide. And here, what we're seeing is an analysis of about 25,000 uh, PubMed uh, records from the British Journal of Pharmacology. Um, and if you can see on the, if you can read the slide on the uh, y-axis, we see dates ranging from 2021 all the way back to 1968, although not as far back as 1946, unfortunately. Um, and I searched this literature for references to gene uh, products, and I used a vocabulary from the Hugo Gene Nomenclature Committee uh, uh, to do this. And what I found was just over 1,400 
of these gene products were referenced in at least one of these publications. So if we look at the heat map, and as we step through time from the top to the bottom, we see an increase generally in the amount of information, so an, in the, an increase in the amount of colour, no doubt partly uh, due to the emergence of uh, new drug targets, which I know several uh, of the delegates have alluded to uh, today. But while we do see this the global trend of a, of a general increase, we do see individual hotspots of activity. So we have a, 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 a hot red spot here that includes COX-2, uh, NOS-3, uh, HERG, and of course we heard earlier about the withdrawal of the, the COX-2 inhibitor role for COXIB uh, back in uh, 2004 over concerns of increased uh, risk of heart attack. Uh, over here, we have another cluster that includes several 5-HT uh, receptor uh, subtypes and the adenosine A1 receptor. Well, but what perhaps you can also see are these large swathes of, uh, of white space, in other words, areas with, with little or no information around the targets that we've studied, and particularly in the, the period uh, preceding uh, 1990. And this touches on another one of the challenges that we face when we're, when we're carrying out this sort of analysis, which is the organization and the optimization of vocabularies for a specific purpose. So here we've used a vocabulary from the HGNC, a gene naming body, and we've applied that effectively to a pharmacology literature set. And the BJP, and, uh, as with other publications, will have used a range of different vocabularies over the years. And of course, as we heard earlier, that there are initiatives to harmonize uh, drug target nomenclature. So it's likely with an appropriately tuned set of terminology, and uh, by that I mean tuned to the, the pharmacology domain, we start to see some signals and we start to see some of these white space areas lighting up. So using the right vocabulary, using that, the right language to, 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 to participate in the right conversation, if you, if you like, is, is always critical uh, for us. So hopefully in the, in, the, in the 10 minutes we've had, hopefully it's given you some idea of the challenges that we face with unstructured information like, uh, like free text from PubMed and the more structured data from the likes of Kemble and the, the gene expression data that we saw and how we've used uh, elements of the workflow to deal with some of these issues. And it's, it's an area that we do continue to, to, uh, to innovate and partner with our clients. So, um, so thank you very much for your time again. Apologies that I couldn't uh, make it in, in person, maybe next year. And thanks to our valued customers and collaborators. So I'll just say thank you and uh, I'll just stop here for any questions. Well, that was quick, wasn't it? Um, so uh, any questions from the audience? I've got one, Paul. How's Nancy? Yeah. She's, she's all right, thanks, Gordon. Yeah, she's tested. It's her second uh, consecutive negative lateral flow test day, so hopefully um, for her at least we've seen the back of COVID-19, but we'll, it remains to be seen. Yeah.